Hi, welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet video podcast. I'm Steve Clapham. And in this edition, this episode, I'm joined by Algie Hall, CityWire journalist, former Investors Chronicle columnist, and author of Four Ways to Beat the Market, a practical guide to stock screening strategies to help you pick winning shares. Algie's new book is an excellent primer on the use of screens to pick stocks or to filter down your watch list, a shorter list of potential targets. Not only does Algie give you four of his favorite screens, he even explains some of the Excel formulae he uses to clean up the data and rank the stocks. So this is proper instruction and real hand-holding for the less experienced investor. Algie and I have been friends for a few years now, and we did a joint column, I think back in 2019, about the failings of audits and how to fix them for Investors Chronicle. And that article actually won an award. So rather amusingly, we're both award-winning journalists. I'm not sure if there's a massive cup or a hideous glass trophy or something, Algie, we'll talk about that later. But this book is about screens and I've got two great offers for you. First, a very special discount off the Coifin equity software platform. Visit bit.ly, B-I-T spot L-Y forward slash B-T-B-S for behind the balance sheet. Coifin, that's K-O-Y-F-I-N and the number one. So bit.ly forward slash B-T-B-S Coifin one for more info and a discount off Algie's book. Use the code BTBS 30 off 30 OFF on the Harriman House website to get 30% off the price of the book and free shipping. Anyway, welcome to the show, Algy. And I always start with the same question. Tell us how you became an investment journalist. Were you always interested in investing? Did you always want to be a journalist? And this was a perfect combination. Well, Steve, my um, story is rather unusual uh, in terms of my route into journalism. I always wanted to be a children's book illustrator. And actually, I'm proud to um, publishing uh, this this finance book. I've published, I think, 11 uh, children's picture books. Um, oh, wow. so, so it's kind of, it's, it, it's very much a sideline because um, anyone who knows anything about children's book illustration will know that very few people make any money in it at all. So um, perhaps my um, my ambition after graduating with a degree in economics and politics was a bit naive, should we say, but it was certainly a passion. Um, anyway, so um, I, I was um, looking for a part-time job to, um, it, it, so, I, so I could fund my, um, you know, my attempts to be an illustrator. And I came across this advert in the Ham and High local newspaper um, a TV production company um, looking for a part-time bookkeeper and PA, which I thought, well, I can do that, you know, I can do that easily. And I turned up to the job interview. I've always looked very young. The, the, the receptionist went up and told the person interviewing me, this, this guy looks 14. I don't think you really want to see him, but if you really want me to send him up, um, I will. <laughs> and so I, got, I trudged up the stairs in my ill-fitting suit. And I met this wonderful man called Lawrence Lever, who actually founded CityWire, who I've gone back to work for recently. And um, he immediately looked at my CV um, with all my kind of, you know, academic record on it and, um, and, was in, and kind of said, oh, wow, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, employ you. And he got me writing for him for the Investment Trust newsletter. And he got me researching stocks for him for, uh, for a fairly small um, fund that he was running at the time. And I, I loved it. And um, I mean, I remember having this moment thinking, you know, if I could just, um, you know, research stocks, like, you know, for is my career, you know, obviously I want to be an illustrator also, but if I am, um, if I can do this, it'd be wonderful. This is something I found something which just actually um, really fascinates me and gels with me. And I, you know, I, I never had set out to be a writer, but I loved the writing process as well. It's, it all came as a bit of a surprise to me and um, really everything went from there. Oh, cool. That's a lovely story. And um, why write a book? Was it because you wanted to share knowledge or make some extra cash, see your name on the Waterstones bookshelf or a bit? Well, obviously, you've seen your name on the Waterstones bookshelf 11 times already. So probably wasn't that. Well, what, what made you want to write a book? Because it's quite a painful process, right? <clears throat> yeah, it is. I mean, I, I am I am actually a kind of book writing obsessive. So I don't know what it is about books, but I, I just... Um, 
I love books. So um, I mean, I've done all these picture books and um, I, and um, doing a finance book appeals to me on that level. But I think more um, and more seriously, perhaps, um, I, I was um, I did the stock screening column for 10 years at the Investors Chronicle. And after about year five, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that, you know, I, I started it. And I, I had, you know, perhaps a naive expectations that, um, you know, if, if I had, if I really applied grounded investment principles, then these screens should outperform. I, you know, wasn't expecting every share highlighted to be one which was a winner. It is very much, you know, stock screens I always view as a basis for ideas for further research. But my view was, you know, it should all come out in the wash and there should be outperformance. Um, <clears throat> and what actually happened was far better than I ever expected because the outperformance, um, you know, was, you know, really exceptional from quite early on. Then obviously it's compounded over those 10 years. And in about year five, I think it was, um, a, a, this wonderful editor who edited my book called Craig Pierce approached me from Harriman House and said, you know, I would be interested in you writing a book on stock screening if you, you know, if you'd like to. And I, I felt it was too early, basically. I felt, you know, five years actually you know we're recovering we're recovering from the um great financial crisis and um I, I kind of thought you know i just don't really um have anything to say on five years of data which i i think is interesting and then it got to around year 10 and i was thinking about you know moving on from the investors chronicle and um you know over that time you'd learn things all the time in investing which is what makes it just so wonderful and fascinating um and um I, so I went back to him and said, you know, I, you know, I'm going to have a 10 year record for all of these. And, you know, I really, you know, know and love, you know, the stories behind, you know, the most important four kind of, you know, strategies, which essentially probably ran through most of the successful stock screens that I was running. And um, so we decided I'd write a book. So it's kind of, you know, this this 10 year experience and probably, you know, you could throw in the 15 years before that because, um you know, knowledge is just, you know, cumulative. I think people talk about compounding knowledge nowadays. <laughs> it's compounding such a much loved um, concept. But um, yeah, so it's, um, it's you know, it's, it was really lovely to basically have, you know, this this book to, you know, put all of that into. Well, good old Craig Pierce, because he edited my book and he's a brilliant editor. Oh. I mean, a really um, amazing editor. So well done, him. And the book has this, fantastic anecdote about was it your great grandfather do you want to tell us tell us that story and why you included it well this is a this is quite a bizarre story and I, I actually wasn't told about it so really quite late on in my um in my life and um well my I, you know in terms of book writing running in the family um my grandfather wrote an entire a huge bestseller off the back of this story kind of it was, it was published about um, three months after his experience. And my sister has also written it. She's a novelist and she wrote a novel based on this story, which was, or, you know, inspired by the story, which was published much more recently. But um, so the story itself, though, is um, uh, my, my great grandfather, who was, he was quite a strange man. He was a Christian scientist and had, you know, certain beliefs. But his wife had died and he was, you know, going through a depression. He was trying to um, you know, get away from it all. And he went, he was going to America to visit family. And he ended up on the ship called the Titanic. Um, and um, so he was there on the fateful night when um, the ship, uh, you know, hit the, hit the iceberg. And he was with this big crowd of people who are essentially wandering around deck. And the way he describes it is fascinating. He's is wandering around deck. And um, no one really thought there was a proper danger because the ship was, you know, obviously advertised as being indestructible and he was with this crowd and um he, he he just decided to walk in the other direction and he um and he just carried on walking and he was called into a lifeboat because there are no more women and children to fill it I mean he was a second class passenger so obviously the the first class passengers were evacuated and then everyone else it was women and children first so um you know as a as, as a second class male on that ship you were very unlikely to survive and he just lucked upon a lifeboat with spaces in. And then an hour later, he kind of describes in his, in, in his account of it, he was just on this completely silent ocean, hearing these people um, singing um, together, uh, which who were part of the crowd he was among. And they was, it, as they sunk into, you know, to their death. It was like, I mean, it's like, it's, it's incredible. Um, 
But anyway, I mean, to move, move back to something which is perhaps more mundane. In well, hang, hang on, before you <laughs> move back, before you move back, what made him walk away from the crowd? Well, this is this is this is something which, in, um, you know, the the family has you know discussed this, and um, some put it down to the fact that he was this you know Christian scientist, which have you know in in there in there's some you know around the belief system in that religion. Um, you know, there are elements of um, you know moving moving away from from the herd. Um, so you know that that could be. He also in his account he talks about. Um, Having a having a memory about the way the ship was um, tilted slightly to one side, and um, potentially, you know, that could have been why he did it. But I mean, he didn't know really oh, was, was the yeah. ultimate thing. But he it, and and it's but it's just it was just an urge which took him, I suppose. And um, you know, maybe there was some kind of you know slight survival instinct in there. It's like you know, I, you know, do I actually want to be with a big crowd? You know, during a traumatic time which um which i think probably actually segues uh, <laughs> into the investment point <laughs> um probably maybe a bit better which is um which is that I've, I've used it in the book uh to describe um contrarian investing or you know the benefit the benefits of being contrarian in certain situations um and yeah and, and which which is a situation where you do know why you're doing it hopefully <laughs> rather than, rather than you, my my great grandfather's situation where he hadn't where he wasn't able to say why he did it no, so well, i mean it's a wonderful story and it, it, it's a fantastic analogy for investing uh, and hopefully if you do stay with the crowd you 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 won't sink but you probably yeah. won't swim as elegantly as if you go in the opposite direction in the right way but Listen, the book covers five topics. Why screens provide an investment edge, how they can be incorporated into your process, the data needed to construct the screens and how to interpret it, how to identify the best shares and avoid duds, and then your four screens, the ideas behind them and how to reproduce them. Now, look, I don't think you want, you want people to buy the book, so you don't want to discuss the details of the screens, but let's start with why. Why do screens work? Is it simply an offset to our sort of weak behavioral wiring or do quants work? Because you, you would imagine that the, the majority of money trading or the majority of trading on stock markets today are quants funds. So you, you would imagine that any screen would be, our, you know, the advantage would be arbitraged away. Have you, have you thought anything about this? Why did screens work? Well, I know you've thought about it because you've written a book. Well, um, yeah, the, the um, I, I mean, I, I think there there are several aspects to it, but one of the things I'm most interested in is um, the um, the work that's been done by um, Daniel Kahneman mainly, and um, it, it's really you know set out in the in the book Noise um, that that, it, that, um, that came out a couple of years ago, I think, with um, two other authors. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think the thing with the screen is it forces people to unpack ideas. If the screen's going to work, you have to really know what you're looking for, why and how to identify it. And um, in, in this work um, by the behavioral psychologists, one of the really big things is that, um, you know, there's a huge value in just kind of really focusing in on the ideas which are going to be most influential on your outcomes. And um, that's something that, you know, everyone should do. You know, there's all there's endless advice about, you know, you have to, you should write things down. You should reassess what you wrote down. You should modify it for new information. But you should always stay focused on, you know, those things which really matter. Because, you know, we know psychologically we're set up to, you know, put the wrong value on information. And especially when we're looking at information that confirms our view on something, we're going to put the wrong value on it. And if there's information which is really investing, arresting and dramatic, we're going to put the wrong um, the wrong value on it. And um, and so when, when you're trying to re weigh up the probabilities of an investment being successful or not, this is, you know, this is deadly stuff. You need a framework. And, the, and also the psychologists find, you know, knowing that these are psychological problems won't solve the problems. You need a framework in order to, yeah. you know, put those ideas into practice. And um, screens essentially are, um, you know, a really good framework for doing this. And I, in 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 the book, I um, 
there's a story from the uh, Daniel Kahneman tells about himself. But I think I think he tells it both in noise and um, uh, thinking fast, thinking slow. Um, about when he's in the um, Israeli army and is a very young lieutenant, um, and he uh, kind of twenty one, I think he was, and he's asked to um, change the vetting procedure in in the army. And they and what what they've been doing is just they've been sitting people down for interviews and asking them a whole load of questions and going, yeah, they they could go there, they could go there, etc. And what he does, he's kind of read up on a um, this amazing study by another psychologist called Paul Meal. And he says, OK, what we have to do is just be systematic. What are the important things which are going to tell us what, where these people should go? We're going, to, um, we're going to assess them individually and score them. And so he did that. And then he, he after doing that, though, it was beginning to work. But he faced a mutiny from the assessors because these people were really put out because they'd been turned into, you know, robots. And it was like, you know, absolutely frightful. You know, they weren't going to do it anymore. And, and you know, who was he? He was 21 years old. You know, he's like... Um, why should I listen to you? And so um, what he did then, he kind of just introduced a test, a holistic test, as he called it. At the end of the process, close your eyes and um, you give your own score. And it was, you know, it's kind of, he thought this would just be terrible again. But what he actually found at the end of it was that was the most informative score out of all the scores that um, they were putting together in this interview process. So that was doing more to improve it than even the scoring of the individual points. And um, the conclusion which, um, you know, he drew and, um, you know, I think has stuck with really throughout his career is that if you are very systematic and assess things systematically, having decided on what's important beforehand, you are going to make a far better decision based using your intuition added into the mix afterwards. And um, yeah, so for, I mean, for me, I think the really probably the most overlooked thing with stock screens is that they are something which um, pushes people, you know, to um, to encapsulate that kind of process in their investing. It's interesting. It's a bit like the I suppose the analogy, a good analogy would be um, chess. So man and man plus machine beats machine or man alone, and that's true, I guess, in a number of fields that the the combination of a person, I mean, uh, with a machine, which is, all, I mean, it's all very, um, AI is very much in the news right now. Yeah. And so, you know, and everybody's sort of frightened that it's going to take their jobs and I suppose it will take some jobs, but the combination of a man and uh, the artificial intelligence, I think will be really um, more powerful. It's interesting. So, you don't need a Bloomberg screen. I mean, you mentioned a couple of UK systems in the book, and I mentioned at the start Coifin, where you know I'm I've got an affiliate program with them. I mean, you do need some sort of software, but it, a few hundred pounds rather than thirty thousand dollars, right? Yeah, yeah, and no, I, I think you know I, I've um, used um, uh, Bloomberg and like you know many other. Um, providers and I mean in terms of what I'm what I what I'm doing with them um, you know trying to uh, create equity ideas Bloomberg's kind of overpowered I you know it's like uh, Bloomberg is obviously fantastic but it's, it's got way more than I need on it so um, at the moment I use Factset um, I've used um, uh, Icon, Bloomberg, um, S&P IQ Capital IQ. I haven't used um, Coifin, but I'm sure you know. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, um, Coifin's got a free option. I don't. I don't know. You know how sophisticated the screening options are in it, but it's an interesting alter alternative to the UK systems. I mean, we talk later about identifying the best shares and avoiding duds. So that's part of the sort of qualitative process after you've run the screens, but. Before we get to that, I've got a number of other questions. The obvious one is, do we need to? I mean, won't the screens just work on their own without any further subjective filters? I mean, you said at the start that the, the screens collectively spat out uh, an outperforming yeah. so, um, set of stocks. So do we, do, we, do we need to do anything more? I mean, we just run the screens and... I, I would say, I mean, I, I don't know. I think if you're a professional investor, you, you know, you could you could look into you know you could look at that as a possible option, but I think for most investors, 
what what you're going what you're faced with uh, um, a drawdowns in periods of underperformance with any screening strategy and once you get that where do you go you know where you know what what are you going to tell yourself because you haven't actually got to know any of your investments and I think that is the most dangerous position to put yourself in so um, I mean you know in in theory you know you could you could run the screens and only pick out the winners you know that and then you'd improve your performance but I don't think that's the main argument. I think the main argument is that, you know, when your back is against a wall, that is when you have to, you know, that's when you're going to really find out about your character. And if you don't actually know, you know, what you're doing, it, and, I, and I mean, you know, you may know the strategy, you may understand and appreciate the strategy, but you've got to know, I think for most people at least, you've got to know the next level down, which is the stocks you're holding, how they're responding to whatever the um, adverse circumstances are, which is making the market, you know, throw a wobbly. And um, that's where your psychological behavioral edge is. It's not in the fact that you just kind of like, you know, bought, you know, five stocks, which was spat out a screen. So I think, um, you know, your, your, you know, screens are, you know, potentially very dangerous if you, um, it, you know, if, if you're just following them blindly. So I, I mean, yeah, I'd always recommend them as a starting point for research. No, it's interesting because um, you you mentioned the book in some years the screen didn't produce enough good ideas, and I, I remember this happening in two thousand and eight to some of the quants, and they were it was like, oh shit, you know we're having you know X standard deviation events every day. I think I, I remember the Goldman Sachs CFO <laughs> saying something like, you know, this isn't meant to happen. We're you were getting <laughs> one in a hundred year events daily, you know, um, but it, so it really caused chaos. You say in the book, marketing conditions change over time. The screens have to adapt. So my question is really, what did you do to tweak your screens? How did you approach that? And how should the lay person, so the sort of regular bloke in the street that hasn't got 10 years of experience running screens, how should they think about this? Because, you know, that's one of the things that it doesn't work all the time. So you do need to understand what you do when it's not working. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um... So, I, I mean, I guess um, that, yeah, there, there, there are two things in terms of, I, I suppose, first of all, um, you know, what, what, I do, what I do to adapt screens. I mean, I, I think, you know, it's interesting, actually, if I can even go back a little bit further in terms of, um, you know, the way quants use, um, the, you know, all, all the empirical research around, you know, what has worked historically in markets. Because, you know, I always, I always look at, you know, the work of quants and yeah, I, I find it amazing. But um Always, I also find it hard to, um, you know, be completely comfy with because I kind of think, you know, if you're a quant, you're looking for an arrow pointing in a kind of straight direction. But I always see that arrow pointing down a kind of very bendy path kind of thing. You know, things change all the time. Yeah. And, you know, just because price to book was the way to do value investing for, you know, X many years up to, you know, a couple of decades ago, you know, there are very good reasons to think don't go near price to book now because, you know, the nature of balance sheets and businesses have changed, you know, massively, and it's going to lead you down, you know, it's going to lead you in the wrong direction. So, um, lead you, you know, to form. Oh yeah, <laughs> God. I mean, yeah, it's you know, there is, and and also, you know, the most valuable assets companies have now, the intangible stuff is not on the books. It's not yeah. you know, there's no home for it. So it's like you know, you can't use it. You're not if you compare you want to compare, you know, all the stocks in the mar in the market, or even just a reasonably broad sway that's that's no good for you so um yeah so but um so there's that side side of adapting to things but then also the market just changes even if you know your basic inputs you know remain valid and um i suppose the best example in the book was um the quality screen i've uh, uh, that i've got in there when because when i started that you know it's 2011 and you could get um quality stocks for not very much money so I um so I shoved in the price to earnings growth ratio because and, and you could and it, you know it was throwing up cheap quality growth plays brilliant you know what what more could you want and sure enough for the I think the first um three or four years it was extremely brilliant and then I started to get um back you know results from the screen you could just tell they weren't you know it's like you know it's getting house builders in there and stocks like that and it's like yeah sure they've got a you know, they've got a very high return on capital, but that's because they're just going to a slightly sweet spot now. It's like, you know, it's coming, you know, the reasons are clear. These are cyclicals. They're not, they're not quality. And um, 
around that time, I also had, um, I was running a, a Zulu principal screen based on the work of Jim Slater. And I had relaxed his quality criteria because I was so fixated on valuation. I got a letter from him saying, um, you're doing this wrong. It's like, well, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be re relaxing, um, uh, you know, uh, value. It's like you've got to double down on quality when, you know, when, when things start to get more expensive. And it, and it was like, you know, it's kind of, you know, he, he, he was, I've always regarded that book as absolutely brilliant. And so, you know, and it, you know, and it was like, oh, I wrote back, you know, say, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Slate. It's wonderful to hear from you. And I will do absolutely as you say. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I was able to write about it in the column and everything. But um, likewise, for my, um, for the quality screen, it was just like, I, I need to just drop this, any consideration of valuation because, you know, quality investing, quality shares, shouldn't really normally be cheap and um and so it's just you know just adapt the screen it's like think about what's really important and in the book i've um highlighted the core tests in all the screens the things which kind of really go to the heart of the strategy so um all of the screens and i think this is the way screens work best you you know you know what you're kind of, you know what you're really going for you know the kind of central um thing you're looking for but then you need supporting tests to kind of you know try and you know make sure what you're what you're homing in on is genuinely the right stuff because a lot of stocks can you know in based on core tests look like they're the real deal and then you look at them and you, you know you, you waste time and you know they're clearly you know actually you know doing something else spitting out the numbers for another reason so um i i kind of highlight those core tests and then you know my main advice is you know if you need to, you know, boost your, um, you know, boost your output, just slightly relax the number of um, the non-core tests they need, a, a stock needs to pass to, um, to, you know, get you to actually have a proper look at it. It's interesting that starting point talking about quality, because of course, you started about the same time as Terry Smith and the Fundsmith. And I think when he started off his portfolio at a 4.8% oh. free cash flow yield. And his letter this week, I think he, he's back down to 2.4 or 2.8. Well, so... I, yeah. I, I don't know if I'm going to be quick enough to find the chapter because I, I when, when I wrote this, it was when um, quality was at its zenith and the quality um, screen. I mean, it's amazing, it's amazing you know, the, the, the amount that you, you know this from your own book, the amount of time it takes from finishing the manuscript to actually seeing your book in print is <laughs> quite phenomenal. So it's kind of a lot of those warnings were, you know, been slightly overtaken by events. But um. I did. I did use. Um, I, I think the most extreme point in um, Terry Smith's letters to point out, yeah, that very thin thing that you know the quality had become so popular over the period that um, it was, yeah, it, the revaluations. We kind of essentially saying you're not going to get these kind of returns going forward. I think my first screen also. I I, um, I looked at the revaluations that um, that they that they had. Um, had over the period and um it was um 150 percent i think that the, that the stock yeah, was i think it'd be elite i think it'd be high, yeah. and yeah it's 50 52 percent i think the puts the all share had revalued by yeah, i did i did find a, a page in my book which told me something <laughs> well done so you make the very important point the research process about asking good questions and you've got a few in the book so the first one is what does the company do well, i think we kind of know how to figure that out. But the second one is, is the company special? And this is quite an interesting one. So you say, does the company have a moat? Is management good? Does the financial performance suggest the company is special, high margins, high returns on capital, strong cash conversion over time? I mean, what what did you leave out? I mean, when, when you're thinking about moats and is the company special, were the things that you thought, oh, that that would be interesting and it didn't work? Or how did you decide in the criteria that you that you selected oh well it, um i mean when it I, I suppose the biggest omission in terms of um the quality screen in the book in particular and and this is because i don't think it works so well with screening it's mentioned in, in you know in, in other sections of the book but i think people um don't look at asset turn very much when assessing quality and you know obviously everyone knows you know amazon and costco and companies like that which have amazing asset turn um so i i think um in, in terms of um, the actual screen itself, which, you know, does that thing of looking for something special. Um, asset turn is something that, you know, 
isn't in there. And I think it's genuinely neglected a lot more by, in, by investors when trying to look for quality stocks, because obviously a high margin is a, is a great indicator of quality because it's like, because, it, you know, the company has something and someone's willing to pay up for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, but it, but it, you know, it could have cost you a fortune to invest in. So it's like, so actually, that doesn't mean anything. But um, uh, so which is where the asset turn comes in. But equally, I mean, obviously, you look at Costco. If you can just keep on selling huge amounts from your, you know, from your, you know, productive asset base, even if it's at a low margin, you know, if that customer base stays there and stays active, you're onto a great thing. Um, I suppose another thing in terms of what makes a company special, which is, you know, has its own chapter in, in, in the book, I, its own section in the book, is um, uh, conservatism, in, which, which is, you know, the dividend strategy. And um, I think a lot of people get confused about dividend investing because they see a value and in income in its own right. Um, and, you know, capital returns are, you know, everything else being equal, cap all, all forms of capital returns are totally zero sum. But... Um, a dividend record and um, low volatility in the share price can tell you you have a conservatively run company. And that type of quality is very easy to underappreciate. And I think especially if businesses is cyclical. And I, I, it's, I mean, it's quite interesting. I've, um, I've, I've, I've done it. I've did a deep value screen this week for um, CityWire Elite Companies, which is what I work for at the moment. And um, a lot of the... Kind of, well, you know, a lot, a handful of um, uh, cyclical but really well run UK small caps, which I know have come up. And obviously, I have to look at them again to see if they are, you know, if they're, if they're still in a good place. But, you know, these are the company type of companies where, um, you know, they just they, they don't they don't look like an obvious quality stock. But over time, because that, they are underappreciated. Um, because conservatism isn't something most investors have any interest in. It's um, you know they they can they can be you know they can produce amazing performance, um and so um I, I suppose that is um yeah a special characteristic which I'd say is definitely overlooked. No, I agree with you. Conservatism is underrated and actually quite hard to find. That's the yes, problem oh, because yes. yeah, it's more and more companies are being much more aggressive in their earnings management. You know, I just done this course. I walk through Apple's 10K and I explain how Apple's become more and more aggressive in its accounting over time. But it's not alone. I mean, you know, just about every 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 company in the US has become more aggressive. And I agree with you in the asset turn. People don't look at it. I mean, one of the first things that I look at is how much PPE do you need to create a, a dollar of sales? You know, do you need more or less than a dollar of of fixed assets to create a dollar of sales. And, you know, that just that simple number tells me quite a lot about what sort of business I'm looking at. So, you know, often when you're looking at new stock, you don't really know what you're looking at initially because you don't really understand the business. And just understanding the financial parameters, I think is is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I don't know why people don't pay more attention to these sorts of things. You know, I think the balance sheets, incredibly in, incredibly useful but it's so i mean it's so informative because i mean it's where you're it, it, you know ultimately you're going to circle back to it anyway because um you know that's you're you're going to get to know the you know what the business does and then it, you're going to and that's the way of you know it will be reflected in the financials if you're right but yeah i i totally agree why you know why people don't just start with you know those really telling numbers is you know it's, it's like mystery sometimes and um yeah my time at the investors chronicle and i was the editor of the ideas section which is the most analytical section on that magazine you know i'd, I'd spend you know hours and hours with them um, the new writers trying to just show them how you know you don't actually have to do so much work if you know you can you can be far more um useful to your to our, to the readers if you just you know if you kind of focus on these key mechanics which you know driving the business, and then and then you know then then go into the story from there because you know you're going to be far more informed when you're actually um speaking to the CEO or whatever it is. No, absolutely. And then the, the other questions you talk about: how does the company finance what it does? So that's working capital, overall capital requirements, structure and level of debt and leases, pension obligations, often, often overlooked, cash generation. Then you've got what's the short and long term outlook. That was quite clever because, of course, that's. 
you know, always considered a, a purely qualitative issue. But you you've done that, I think, quite cleverly. So you talk about our brokers upgrading forecasts, structural, cyclical growth opportunities or risks, industry capacity, pricing power. Are the shares being shorted? How did you? Are there any interesting holders? I mean, there, there's loads of stuff there that I, I I strongly believe in. How did you come up with these uh, criteria? I mean, well, um, I mean, I, I suppose uh, the the advantage I had writing that section of the book is that these were the things I've been kind of drilling um, investor chronicle <laughs> chronicle writers with, <laughs> you know, ages. So yeah, you know, you end up kind of, you know, is, is, you know, you're you're like a magpie when you're, you know, trying to, you know, research stocks, anything useful and any, you know, it's any shorthand you can get, which will kind of, you know, it doesn't have to be the actual thing. It can be a proxy for the actual thing. So, you know, I, I know from, I mean, your book has wonderful lists of, um, you know, all these things people can look out for. And I know you're a fan of um, uh, upgrades as well, which I, I, you know, I just, I'm, I, you know, I, I think that's such a, you know, powerful way to come actually, you know, get behind, you know, there's something going on. You won't know what it is exactly, you know, immediately. But, um, you know, there's, but there's some... a problem with that, Algy, because how does the average man in the street know that the stock's getting upgraded? Are there tools to do that? For it, Well, the, I mean, the, the two um, ones in the UK, the two um, data services in the UK that I think are really good for private investors. And, uh, you know, I apologise, you, you know, because if, my, if, if it, my knowledge means that because I've always used professional tools. I may not, I may, may be excluding someone, but there's Stockopedia and SharePad, and both have um, upgrade data on there. SharePads, I, I think they're kind of pulling it out so it's easier to use, but it, you can only see it on um, on charts at the moment. I think that's right. But um, that, it, it is out there, but it's hard to get. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of these really useful bits of data, which, um, you know, I'm always publish it, publishing it in any articles I write. Because I think it's so wonderful, and I can, you know, I, I, you know, I, I get it in all the my own sheets which I've constructed for myself. But um, you, so if you pay for it, you can get it basically. Yeah, um, no, sure. I mean, I, I mean, interestingly, I, I used to use it, and you know, so I, I used to start weight the sort of analysts that I thought were better. You know, if it was something, you know, yeah. a stock that I knew. Yeah. Um, but you know, obviously, what I would be, you know, I would be hoping that I was ahead of the pack. So if I own something right. and my forecasts weren't higher than the street, I would kind of worry. Uh, or and if they were, you know, sometimes the street would be catching up, and I wouldn't be raising my projections at the same rate. And then you know that was kind of like a second derivative thing. Oh right, well maybe this isn't. You know maybe we're nearing the end of this story rather than. The beginning of this story it often happened. You know, once you own the stock for a couple of years, you kind of it, it you, you know, the, the, buying cheap stocks and trying to you know make a big return out of a re-rating and revaluation. Often, uh, the, the, you know, it's got a limited life. You know, you can't do it. You can't own them forever. You, often, they're not that great quality stocks. They've just been overlooked. Yeah, what a fascinating. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's a great process. So obviously, you, it needs to be it's someone like you doing it has kind of deep analytical kind of like understanding of the company. Um, but yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating. And then your your last one, your last question in the light of points one to four is there a valuation case? And you say consider free cash flow yield, EV to EBIT, EV to NOPAT, EV to sales, price to book. No EV, EBIT, da algae. Well, the private equity people will be going, oh, this is a rubbish book. I mean, he doesn't know. So tell me why you haven't put, I mean, I'm so pleased you I mean, EV, but, uh, but tell tell the viewers why. I So so I I, I suppose, you know, listen, you, you can use any, anything. I'm not I'm not kind of like being um, prescriptive. And I, you know, I, I was talking down price to book. I mean, obviously, you know, price to book, if you're dealing with a real estate stock or a house build or something like that, you know, or a bank, it's, you know, that's, that's your, you know, that's your go-to. Um, so EV EBITDA, I mean, I, it's just like if you're leaving out the um, DA bit, <laughs> like, what, you know, <laughs> well, you're making some big assumptions. Kind of thing. Yeah. Like, so, um, I mean, you know, I'd just prefer to use, um, you know, if you can get, a, you know, a decent free cash flow number um, or, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be far better off because, you know, the, the uh, depreciation and amortization, uh, you know, 
they're really important numbers. But and and also, you know, then you have that thing that you know people aren't made to account for their intangibles as assets; are made to account for them as costs. So um, actually, that 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 bit of bit of the accounts is far less informative when making comparisons um, than um, than you know you you you'd think kind of thing because it's like you know it's only telling you about the tangible assets mainly and probably acquired good goodwill as well um so yeah i mean i just don't think it's such a great number and uh, the earnings number again i think for similar reasons i mean you know it's, they're so ubiquitous as well it's like you know you know every, everything which is in there has been so scrutinized it's probably become worthless um but yeah the earnings number just uh, you know it's kind of it's it's, it's potentially you know a really good guide to you know the narrative around um, the financial year, but um, it's you know it, it's so looked at and so manicured, and, and you know and there has to be manicured because people are explaining um, you know the matching exercise that's happened during the year. So you know I, I have you know sympathy for that, but I just think it's far you know less useful than some of the other numbers people can look at, and I don't know if in my list. Um, uh, I imagine there would be EV to sales, which um, yeah, no, I, you've got you've got yeah. EV to sales. I, I mean, I was quite surprised that you didn't u use PE because I would have thought that that would be quite a useful screening input. Well, I mean, well the, the interesting thing actually is that um, a lot of my experience with stock screens kind of confirmed some some of these things. So um. Uh, I, I mean, because I, I did a lot of guru screens in my column, and some of them are really quite old. So um, I, sp I suppose a good example, actually, is um, the Joel Greenblatt screen, uh, his magic formula, the, that really simple screen, which is valuation and quality. And he does it based on earnings in his book. And actually, you know, it did, it did do all right in the, in, in the UK. Um, it, so this, you know, there was like was some of the other screens which looked more at earnings, um, such as the David Dremen screen, like, really were I, I thought dodgy kind of thing in terms of their output quite often but um the the green black screen the earnings version i had i then i de then did a version based on cash so free cash flow yield and um croppy so your cash um return on capital employed and that that did so much better than um the earnings version and i i, I was doing it thinking you know cash is lumpy so you know if i'm using free cash flow yield probably the results, you know, won't be so good because, you know, and you know, this is all written up in the column and everything, um, it, you know, it, it, because, you know, we'll just be seeing companies which have, you know, lucked out on, you know, they've had some cash win for that year, which they won't be getting again. But the reality was that cash screen did, you know, brilliantly well. And it, you know, and it was just avoiding some of those accounting issues, which um, make um, earnings numbers and, and also balance sheet numbers. I mean, I was using a balance sheet number in capital, um, capital invested. But um, it was just dodging some of those some of those issues and um, just spat out like re you know created really you know much stronger performance. So um, yeah, no, I, I think um, you know I did feel by the time I came to writing the book that not only was I skeptical um, on the value of earnings, um, you know, just based on the you know the issues that I knew about, but the actual screens that I'd been running kind of confirmed it to an extent. Interesting. And it's not just about fundamentals. I mean, I think too many analysts ignore the technical factors and don't worry about things like the stock's momentum. And funny, Anthony Bolton emailed me this week and I'd sent him a copy of my book. I bumped into him and I, I said, oh, you know, I'd love to, to send you a copy of the book, see what you think. And I was really surprised. I mean, I just sent him the copy of the book. I, you know, I've been a great fan and admirer of his. I was an investor in his fund and and I like, you know, I loved his book. And I was very surprised. He emailed me and gave me this long criticism. I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was very nice. You know, he said, uh, you know, I agree with this. And actually, I, I did this slightly differently. And I mean, he always likes to look for technical confirmation. And so there's a great investor. And I've always thought, you know, the share price is a really useful piece of information. People don't, people, Oh, you know, we don't want the, the, the technical charting. Oh, that's all rubbish, you know. But actually, you know, there's a reason why a share does well, that more people are buying it than they're selling it. And you ask yourself, well, why is that? I mean, not saying that um, that you should 
you know be religious about it but there's a lot of people that pay a lot of attention to to these things so you'd be silly just to completely ignore it so tell tell us about what sort of technical factors momentum factors you use and and why you use them and what you picked and what you dismissed well, I, I, I suppose what I use is, I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, um, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not a kind of chartist. Kind of, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't have a great understanding, um, you know, of, you know, using the, you know, the kind of technicals that chartists use. So it's kind of, it's very, what I use is very. Um, no candlesticks. No candlesticks and no, uh, it's, um, yeah. mostly, um, mostly just, yeah, just plain old line graphs I'd look at but um uh in in the book I mean I, I just use um uh straightforward moment price momentum coupled with earnings momentum based on forecast upgrades and uh for, you know, and forecast growth and but I um the, the screen I use I just look at persistent momentum over several time periods which can you know can potentially just boil down to a very recent recent time period but um the, the the idea is you know um if you have a story um if you have upgrades stretching a decent way into the future and you can see momentum going a decent um way into the past i mean 12 months is as far as you know i think it's worth going but it you know the screen i use goes to that then you you know you bring them together and um it should give you a really you know that it should shine a light on those stocks where People are excited and they're excited for a reason because I mean I, I think that's um with momentum it, the you know the really hard part of it is that most of us want to jump onto the story when it's almost played out we you know we're we're kind of you know our instinct uh, the human instinct is to be you know the last one through the door and <laughs> suffer the the full draw drawdown with and with momentum drawdowns can be awful but um. So, yeah, so the idea is just kind of, you know, marrying together uh, lots of different types of momentum and price momentum being a very important part of it. And I also, I always put great onus on three month momentum. And um, I, I just, uh, the reason for that is, God, I've forgotten when, it was when AB and AMRO used to put out their yearbook and there was a massive study on um, momentum investment across all asset classes and I was fascinated by um, by it and I picked over it and just tried to figure out you know in terms of you know what makes sense in terms of cost and in terms of you know period to follow uh, you know how you know you, you know I was, I was thinking about it in pure in terms of pure momentum can you know what makes sense in terms of the period to watch out for and what makes sense in terms of the period the holding period and for me, the you know the optimal thing from that research, and it was only you know vague, was three month price, one year holding period, um, which I also had a screen for <laughs> back at the IT. Um, <clears throat> actually, that that screen was three month, three month, but um, uh, but yeah, and, and and so yeah, three three month men momentum I think is incredibly powerful, and also if you look at it. In terms of market recoveries, which I've, you know, I, I did some work trying to figure it out historically, um, it's not at all bad um, in terms of tenure when a market has be gone beyond that kind of like, you know, slightly um, skittish phase and like, you know, it's gone up, but it's going to come back down again. Once you're three months in, you're far more likely to be, um, you know, riding a meaningful recovery and yeah. maybe into the next bull market. And then you know we talked about quality earlier i mean you you use the sort of return on equity above median for the three years how did you arrive at that and what other things did you consider and dismiss and so um yeah the, i mean this is kind of like uh in, you can, you know, it's, in, it's in the book and everything but it's it's very much to do with the practicalities of stock screening the return on equity choice because um it's just a very easy number to get good data on. And when I started that, that screen, the data provider we were using at the time, I just really wasn't sure about the other, um, you know, the other kind right. of balance sheet, you know, main balance sheet quality ratios. And um, so I, I kind of, you know, I am denied and return on equity, obviously it's great weakness is that you can like really um, jazz it up by just taking on loads of debt, which kind of 
especially the the quality argument. Especially the last ten years, right? Because that was actually, yeah. Yeah, and we're yeah we're we're learning the consequences of that. Thames, some... Thames Water would be a good uh, return. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so and and so that brings me on to the next thing I was going to say, Steve. Beautifully. Um, so I, I married it with a debt test, a, you know, just a debt to make sure the balance sheet was in decent nick. Um, and that does exclude certain companies, because I'm in Thames Water, the argument you'd make for it, or oh, I suppose less geared utilities, really. The, the argument you'd make is that, you know, these are very solid earning, you know, income streams. So leverage them up, you know, this debt is um, a friend to equity holders if it's done right. Um, and the earnings are stable enough. So, um, I, you know, the screen misses out on that type of, you know, quality play. But it's also, I mean, you know, there are other ways to get to that that kind of, you know, just stable defensive business um, and the type of quality that um, the screen that the screen's looking for is, you know, is kind of really great companies rather than ones which are kind of protected by um, that kind of defensive positioning. And I loved you talk about value investing lessons. So you mentioned regression to the mean is ubiquitous force that influences the trading of companies and the valuation of their shares. When companies do badly, investors tend to become excessively pessimistic. Capitulation can create amazing bargains. Contrarian investing is very risky. Intangible accounting standards have created major problems for additional valuation measures based on profits and book value. I think that, that was a really good encapsulation of the lessons from value investing but why do you think screens are a solution to these problems or in what way can screens help overcome those those issues well i mean i i think this is i I suppose value investing is the um area where it's most hard to see the opportunity in front of your face probably because it is that amazing thing i mean when when with all these investment strategies the great thing is you've got the empirical work, which, you know, kind of gives you, I, I, I see it as giving you a guide. It comes, you know, just goes, there's something going on here. And then you have the work by the psychologist, the behavioral psychologist, which can help, help you explain the human aspect of it as, as to why these numbers are, you know, being found by the empirical um, people. Um, and when it comes to value investing, you're going to hate the stock probably. It's kind of, you know, you're, you know, you, that's the point. It's kind of like, you know, there's lots to hate. And um, and when we hate things, or, you know, when we found things to dislike about uh, situations, it's, you know, we just think that's how it is. And it's the same, you know, so there's, there's the opposite side, which is growth investing. People who look at growth and don't pay any attention to quality and follow the story, they're always, they're routinely overpaying. Because, um, you know, we get seduced by great stories and we always think, you know, yeah, the quality will follow. Of course it will. <laughs> Pelt on and, you know, whatever else. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, so so anyway, yeah. So you need to really be shaken out of the stupor when it comes to, you know, looking at value stocks. And, you know, it's kind of it doesn't mean, you know, everything's going to, you know, you need to kind of, you know, completely uh, throw away your um your qualms about these kind of situations but you do you know that there's situations where almost by definition you need to look at them with fresh eyes and say yeah but what if this company can regain the form it was in prior to xyz happening yeah no that's um, very very sensible so um do you want to tell people where they can find you and i'll wrap up and remind people about the book offer oh brilliant okay sure steve um so uh, yes, where they can find me is um, I, I I'm I'm, I'm going to give a bit of, of a plug for the project I'm working on now. I hope you don't mind, um, but um, <laughs> it is a great project. So I think it's um, one worth knowing about. So I joined um, rejoined Citywire about a year and a half ago uh, for a project where called Citywire Elite Companies, and what we've done we've got the holdings data of all the um kind of about five percent of the best fund managers in the world and um we've um created a method to rank the shares by how much conviction those managers have in aggregate in in those in those stocks and we followed a lot of academic research to make sure our methodology is smart and um We've um, kind of created what we think is a really smart methodology for aggregating, which has been approved by um, AKG, who are independent actuaries. 
Um, and so we, we've got all these stocks. We, ra we rate them. We kind of give them a, from a triple A for the most high conviction holdings, the biggest bets of the best fund managers, down to a plus rating for, you know, there, there's someone overweight in there, but it's not a big bet. And then what I'm also doing is I'm screening them because so I'm, so I'm kind of, I'm screening a screen. So our universe has kind of already been screened for there being smart money going into it and following it. And then we're doing lots of interesting um, screens. More so just highlighting, you know, the, the rankings. So I think our, our top 10, we've just reached a year following um, the top 10, which we reshuffle quarterly. And they produced a total return of 42% at a time when the MSCI produced 18% as a total return. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah no, so I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a very good start. And we're going to, we're, you know, now we've got a year's worth of data, we can start you know, going into it a bit more in a bit more depth and finding out, you know, what's going on with performance. But there's a lot of academic research which suggests this is a route into, um, you know, finding really interesting companies and really interesting investment ideas, which is what I've always been all about. So, yeah, that's CityWire Elite Companies. And that's, and that's a subscription service. No, it's um, the, the business model uh, means that we're keeping everything totally free, all the journalism, all the ratings. Uh, so we, we've got a, we've got a model which means that we want people to look and use the ratings, um, especially you know professional investors. We've got a big audience of um, professional investors at Citywire, which is really you know the you know why is really exciting to for, the, for Citywire to be launching a, a, a project where it's rating companies. So um, oh, that's know, fascinating. That sounds... go, and, go and have a have a look, come use the tool, and find out you know what companies are. You know, to cool. the... <laughs> Audrey, thanks so much for coming on the show, sharing these uh, helpful insights into stock screening. The book genuinely is a useful tool for anyone interested in using screens, a way to find stock ideas and as a filtering method, to find stocks for further exploration. If you'd like to use screens, don't forget, we've got a great offer of a very special discount off Coifin. Visit bit.ly, B-I-T spot L-Y forward slash B-T-B-S Coifin one. That's K-O-Y-F-I-N, the number one, for more info. And you can use the code B-T-B-S 30 off, 30-O-F-F, on the Harriman House website. And that will get you, yes, 30% off the price of the book and free shipping. My only reservation about the book, and it, it certainly doesn't imply any criticism, it covers this 10-year bull market to the end of 2021 with only the pandemic-induced sharp drawdown in March 2020. So like all the, anything covering that period, it, it, there's a sort of uncertainty about how applicable it will be to the next decade. But I mean, I think that's always the case with a, a book of this type. And I think the really valuable thing about the book is it explains the thinking behind the screens, which is, my, in my view, is key to understanding how they work in different environments. It's a good book and certainly worth 20 quid of your of your money. It could be a good investment. Algie, thanks so much for sharing your experience. And viewers, don't forget, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And why not sign up for our weekly newsletter on our website, behindthebalancesheet.com. It's free. Thank you for your support.